Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 174 of Actors with Issues with me, your host, Juan Ayala. I'm an actor and journalist who loves talking shop with actors and getting into the issues, how they got to where they are today, and the lessons that they learned along the way. In today's episode, we speak with Stephen Boyer, who you've seen across TV, film, and Broadway from Chicago Fire, We Crashed in Love Life, to his Tony-nominated performance in Hand to God, and now starring in the new musical Kimberly Akimbo, which is in performances now at the Booth Theater on Broadway. Stephen talks to us about his journey with the show and that of his character and some of the lessons that he learned during the dry spell of his career after he made his Broadway debut fresh out of college. He also shares his advice for young actors today, believe in yourself and fuck the haters. (laughs) Before we dive in, please be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you may be listening or watching. Leave us a comment or review if you enjoyed the episode. And now please enjoy my conversation with Stephen Boyer. Stephen Boyer, you are now on the Actors with Issues stage. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, So take us on the journey. When did all of this uh, acting stuff start for you? Oh, wow. You're going way back. Okay. (laughs) Um, When did all the acting stuff start? Uh, When I, I, like, when I was like seven, Mm. I was, um, was very hyper- kid and did a lot of impressions of uh my family and friends and anybody that i saw on tv and i basically would not stop performing in front of my family so uh they put me on stage uh at the first opportunity just to kind of get some peace i think um and it was i i I grew up next to otterbein college in westerville ohio and they did uh, a production of carousel and I was the littlest snow child in the stair steps <laughs> at seven. And I loved it. I got to hang out backstage with all the college kids majoring in in drama. And they taught me how to play poker. And <laughs> I hung out with them instead of, you know, the other kids in the show. Because I was just like, these people, these are my people. <laughs> um, and so after that, I just started doing children's theater for you know, for the rest of my young life. And I was in like two, three shows at a time in Columbus, Ohio and Central Ohio and just couldn't stop. And I mean, you've been in the the business for a a while at this point. So I'm curious, was there, you know, every career has its sort of peaks and valleys and times where we're on a high and then other times when, uh, you know, we wish we were working. So I'm curious, was there ever a point that you felt okay, I gave this a try, this is it? Or did you always just sort of like go full speed ahead? Um, I I sort of, uh, I, I shifted into sort of different aspects of performance during mm-hmm. certain times. I mean, when I, I first got out of school, I, I booked uh, a Broadway gig in a revival of I'm Not Rappaport, where I was like in one scene where I mug Judd Hirsch and Ben Vereen with a knife (laughs) and then you never see me again. But, you know, at 22, I'm like, oh my God, I'm on Broadway. How, this is so much easier than everyone said it was going to be. And uh, I was sure that, you know, the next job was right around the corner, but, you know, cut to 10 years later and I'd maxed out credit cards paying my rent. And it was, it was, it was bad. So pretty much for the entirety of my twenties, I really didn't work very much at all. Mm. And uh, so I was starting to go a little nuts because I just didn't have an outlet. And then I started doing stand-up comedy for a while, um, which sort of progressed very quickly. I got passed at a couple clubs and met some other comics and ended up going on the road as like an opening and a feature act for for a headliner for like three and a half months. And um, so there was a time where I was paying my rent as a comedian Mm -hmm. and I was like, am I ever going to go back to acting? You know, it's like, it was kind of like, it was a crossroads and I didn't know if I was going to go into comedy writing or somehow come back to acting. And um, I think Moritz von Stolpnagel, the director cast me in a drama league directing fellows short. And he was like, you should be working more. And I'm like, well, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think so too, but, uh, you know, other people don't agree. And, um, and then 
Moritz kind of became a champion of mine and started casting me in more and more things. You know, he directed Hand to God, which went from off, off to off to to on Broadway. Mm -hmm. He cast me in Trevor, which was this, you know, insane play by Nick Jones. And he uh, he kind of brought me back from the brink of going into stand up and comedy writing as a, as my full time gig. Um, which is good because, you know, at a certain point I was like, I don't really want to be a stand up comedian. I want to be an actor. Mm -hmm. And I, I always felt like, you know, even when no one was casting me, I still felt like there was, I'm like, I know I can, I know I can do this. Mm -hmm. I just, I just don't have the opportunity at the moment. Yeah. All you needed was that sort of just like hand to reach out and be like, all right, let's yeah. give you a shot. Yeah. Yeah. I need, I needed somebody to like be my champion and mm -hmm. actually believe that I could do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, with Kimberly Akimbo, uh, I know you were in similar to hand of God, you were in the off Broadway production and then uh, coming onto the Broadway production, uh, which I did get to see last week. And I mean, I would be lying if I said it didn't tear up a couple of times. It was <laughs> incredible. I absolutely loved the show. I, huge fan of um victoria clark and of you know uh, i've had some of your cast members on the show before they were even in um uh, kimberly akimbo when they were sort of at the peak of covid and right all of us actors were stuck home and i had some of them on uh so i'm curious uh, how early because i know you're in the off-broadway production but how early were you involved in the sort of developmental process um uh, I, for, for Kimberly Akimbo, I really just came on for the off Broadway, uh, run. I was, I know that there had been several workshops <clears throat> like there always are with new musicals over the course of, of a few years. Uh, and I was, I was not a part of, uh, any of the workshops. I, I auditioned and was cast in February of 2020, hmm. uh, one month before, everything stopped and uh i was like well let's see if this show sticks around um the atlantic wanted to they knew they had a good thing and they they would send out an email every few months being like okay you get you guys still you still on board because we, we're still gonna do this yeah. right you still around and uh a year and a half after uh the shutdown they're like okay green light everybody come on over and we're going to start rehearsing this and um so we just had to hold on you know through a global pandemic but eventually it got going but uh so i was involved um in in the rehearsal room uh mm -hmm. for the off broadway run and i'm curious how would you say or if the character has changed and how the show has evolved between those two productions uh despite sort of <clears throat> just the size but um, how would you say that it's changed um, there are, if you actually look at the script, there's very tiny what David Lindsay Bear calls surgical changes that have been made, but all of them uh, reverberate across the entire story. Um, most of the changes are things to sort of center the story around Kim, make sure that, that she does not get lost as our protagonist, you know, through this world of, uh, crazy, you know, family characters and uh, high school friends and things. And she, uh, but the the biggest difference um, was with the parents, with Kim's parents mm. and, um, and, and Buddy, my, my character had, had the most changes between off Broadway and on. Um, uh, the parents and Buddy especially, Buddy was a lot more clueless, uh, if you can believe it. <laughs> In the off-Broadway <laughs> version, um, he had no real awareness when he was disappointing or hurting his family and his daughter. Uh, and I think, you know, when you're, when you're playing to an off-Broadway audience that's mostly jaded New Yorkers, you can have a character be a little more clueless, a little less self-aware and audiences will sort of accept it and, you know, be, and still their humanity can still shine through. When you have a Broadway audience, which is a lot of, you know, tourists and 
and people that maybe aren't accustomed to seeing uh, the gritty off-Broadway characters, um, you need to spell it out a little bit more that like, no, this person does still in spite of their foibles, they do love their daughter. They, they are not a villain. They still have like humanity and, you know, good intentions. And uh, so there were just tiny little changes that were made. Like, you know, Buddy apologizes now. He knows now when he screws up. He didn't really apologize off Broadway for anything, for anything that he did. And you've seen the show, you know, he screws up a lot, yeah. <laughs> like a lot, a lot. So just the fact that the Broadway version, he acknowledges his his screw ups was huge. Mm -hmm. People still aren't sure if they like Buddy or not, or if they or if they really hate him. But but that's great. I mean, I think that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. When you're sort of on that line, you're like, yeah, yeah, because, you know, there's plenty of people in life where you're not sure <laughs> about that either. So you're like, I'm not, I, don't know. I don't know if I'm on board with them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's this uh, comedian I grew up watching. He says something similar sort of about family. Like, you know, you can love your family, but you don't have to like them. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you'll cry exactly. at their funeral, but you won't go on a vacation with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, with as you were talking about it with the buddy, he uh, apologizes and uh, has a lot of growth throughout the span of the show, which it's not entirely clear how long of a span it is, but it feels like a couple of days or a week, if, if anything. Yeah, um, it's pretty short. It's yeah. pretty short. I think it's I think it's it's like no more than two weeks, mm. the whole course of the show. But yeah, he he does have growth, and then in the end, it's kind of we're not really sure if Buddy or Patty, you know, if either of Kim's parents are actually able to get there mm. in in that time period. Yeah, which is a reality for so many parents. You know, it takes a yeah. long time for for folks to change and. For yeah. kids too and for all of us to go through things and reflect and actually yes. put action uh toward those yeah changes. you can spend a lifetime waiting for someone to change and it it just won't happen yeah and uh i'm curious if you have made any sort of discoveries about uh buddy since you started with the show yeah i think uh buddy buddy's a lot funnier than i thought <laughs> in the beginning i yeah. mean in the beginning when we were doing it off Broadway especially in rehearsal and before we got in front of an audience I was like I was just objectively looking at Buddy's circumstances you know he has a daughter who is essentially terminally ill who is nearing the end of her life um, her life expectancy uh, he is an alcoholic his wife is you know a self-centered narcissist hypochondriac he his <laughs> Uh, spoiler alert his uh his baby that is coming is not his and um and he works at a gas station so you know there's he doesn't have a whole lot going for him and so i was i just looking at it from an outside point of view i really leaned into how depressed i would be <laughs> if i was in his shoes i was like this sucks i mean his life is is pretty pretty awful and uh and it really took David, Lindsay Abair, and Janine to story to sort of pull me back and be like, yeah, but if I Janine said it once when we were rehearsing uh this the song that he he's giving advice to his unborn daughter, uh he's like singing some advice into a video camera, and she's like, if he fully acknowledges the regrets of his life he would jump off a bridge. She's like, he wouldn't be here singing this song. He would be in the bottom of a river. I'm like, oh, okay. And she's like, so he can't give in to it. He has to, in spite of it, you know, buoy his spirits up and make light of everything around him. It, you know, this is how how he deals is, it's like Buddy. Buddy is either laughing or he's yelling. It's like he's either overwhelmed by the stressors of his life and just like taking it out on people around him or he's forgetting about it, having a drink and laughing. Um, and those are kind of his two modes. And 
it took me a while to find the laughing. I mean, for mm -hmm. a long time, I was like, this is just depressing. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, with the name of our show being actors with issues, we, um, have gotten a bit into sort of, you know, talking about career things and all of that, but, uh, I'm curious if you, what, what are the biggest changes you've noticed in the industry, um, since you started to, to now? Um, Hmm. You know, I mean, I feel like, uh, awareness of things like gender parity is something mm. that is uh just wasn't even part of the conversation you know even 10 15 years ago i mean like the amount of like seasons where it would just be you know white male playwrights and white male directors for every theater every season mm -hmm. and nobody really i mean like it was not a big part of the conversation. The fact that there's just this homogeny across yeah. every programming, you know, all, all the programming of all, all the off Broadway theaters was like, it was just, it all just kind of, it was people who were all looked the same. And <laughs> the amount of Neil LeBute plays was <laughs> off the charts. It's like they, I think people talking about, uh, things like gender parity and uh, misogyny in in theater has definitely increased, but not necessarily been solved. Right. <laughs> it's just like an awareness of it. It's like, oh, we should do better. And there's some gestures, you know, being made in that direction. But for the most part, um, it's a lot of the same. Yeah. Just now people are like, they can, we can point to it and be like, Look, it's more of the same in spite yeah. of the outcries of the past years. Yeah. And, you know, it's um, it's a little frustrating when people, you know, especially for myself as a Latino, there's not much representation on Broadway. We have sort of the big three or uh, West, Side, it was West Side Story, just that show for like 50 years. And then, you know, the Cheetah Rivera, anything she was in, it's like, oh, other like Latinas can play Velma Kelly and uh, <laughs> spider woman and all, you know all of that and then uh in the heights came along and then hamilton and you have shows like on your feet but you know those shows the only show that's still on is hamilton and even west side story is half white written by white men we love stephen yeah. sondheim we love bernstein and all of that but you know just not having that representation can be kind of frustrating because it's like do we have a place here i don't know if <laughs> <laughs> or do we go the TV route where there's a little bit more? Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, and the pointing to something like West Side Story, I mean, like, but there's West Side Story. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but Lin for the past mind, it's 50 like, well, years. Yeah. You know, people always say, but Lin Manuel, I'm like, yeah, he, he's an incredible he's talent, but he can't <laughs> be guy. the only one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like, you have 50, like you said, you have 50 white playwrights and white directors and all of that, mm -hmm. but it's like, okay, can we. <laughs> Yeah, pull a really seat up to the table. Not not representative of of the world. Yeah, or like just New York, like you know, oh, the talent yeah, pool is is so much more diverse than than what the numbers are showing. But um, yeah, and also you know, similarly, I'm curious if there are any sort of like um, misconceptions that you've maybe debunked uh, throughout your career. If there's something that you sort of went into the industry thinking that you know you were told that your whole life it's like this and then you got into it and you're like oh my god it's not that at all no one knows what they're talking about um i think there was an idea uh when when i was sort of like starting out or younger um in the business that uh the talent would always rise to the top mm. and i'm sorry to say that i know a lot of really exceptionally talented people that aren't even doing it anymore because they it just they couldn't make a life in it in in the theater or in showbiz and so the idea that like if you just hang on the talent's always gonna rise to the top it's like i don't know that that is really true mm -hmm. i feel like the number one factor for anyone's success is dumb luck <laughs> really <laughs> it is just dumb luck like you happen to be in this room at this time and and you happen to get you know something that 
sends the trajectory of your life in the, in a certain direction and and i feel like so many of the things that uh the the factors that really make up like concrete success or or career success in this industry are not talent based i feel like i i've heard people say everyone's talented and and it's true everyone has you know everyone that's that starts out doing this is talented and they all have unique everyone has the thing that is unique to them and makes them special and makes you want to watch them and hear their story and watch them you know interpret other stories but again opportunity unless you're given the opportunity you you can't show how talented you are and so uh the the young naive you know just out of college idea of the talent's always going to rise to the top i don't think that's true anymore yeah because i've seen too many people drop out of the business that i'm like this person should be famous you know yeah yeah there's yeah. a lot of unemployed very talented people out there yeah for sure yeah. and um our final question, uh, as we always wrap up our show, is uh, in 10 words or less, what advice would you give to a young actor? Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Fuck the haters. <laughs> 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 That's it. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Fuck the haters. <laughs> Fuck the haters. Come on. Don't let the bastards get you down. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. They're always the loudest, but they're not the most correct. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Just believe in yourself. That's yeah, it. I forget who said it, but it's like, you know, ignore the booze. They always come from the cheap seats. <laughs> <laughs> they're always in the back. Way they're never in the front row. They're not that they're not that brave. <laughs> always yeah. way in the back. As well. Steven, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Um, if uh, anyone wants to give you a follow on social media or anywhere, where can they find you? I'm I, I you know what? I, I used to be like all over Twitter. I'm <laughs> off Twitter now. I'm out. It's a scary place. <laughs> I'm out. I got rid of my Facebook a few years ago. I, the only the only thing I'm on right now is Instagram. That's it. It's and I'm Steve Boyer five thousand. Awesome. And folks, you know the drill. You can give us a follow on Instagram at Actors with Issues. Give me a follow at Juaniel Official and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts for new episodes every Monday and bonus episodes throughout the week. Kimberly Akembo is in performances now at the Booth Theater on Broadway in New York City. Please go see the show. It is absolutely wonderful. I'm Juaniala. This is Actors with Issues, and we'll see you next week.